Functional range conditioning, I have a Google Doc here for you. So after the lecture, if you click on this Google Doc, you'll get all this information regarding videos and strategies, what we're going to go over today in class. So if you're more interested, you can check out functional range conditioning site here. It's used by a lot of different clubs right now. Nike was the first to adopt uh, FRC and Kin Stretch. The LA Lakers, Buffalo Bills is a recent addition. Uh, Braves and a lot of different teams right now. It's being used at the ONA Academy for UFC fighting and many organizations are starting to implement FRC and kin stretch strategies at their clubs. So as an athletic trainer and personal trainer, you need to understand some of these methods, especially since it's starting to contradict a lot of the old methods. All right, so what is functional range conditioning? A system of training which applies scientific methods to the acquisition and maintenance of functional mobility. So who can define functional mobility? Who thinks they can define functional mobility? What does that mean? Who can define mobility? Just being able to move. Okay, to be able to move. Okay. Who can define flexibility? Okay, so passively using a barrier or an input to put your uh, joint in a different range of motion. Good. So functional mobility is a little bit different. Functional mobility is is the, the, the ability to move, but also to control your movements. So to understand the difference between mobility and functional mobility is that mobility is really about, yes, you can move. You're able to move, but functional mobility is the active control of that mobility. So it's articular strength and neurological control. Uh, you build articular resilience, so you're adapted to uh, load, increased load bearing capacity, injury mitigation. We really can't prevent injury, but we can mitigate injury. And then you also have articular health and longevity. So your brain learns through mechanoreceptors in force is the language of cells. So each cell is first arrived of a fibroblast. And what that basically means is wherever your body is moving, whatever your body needs, your cells are gonna adapt to what you do. So the more we sit, the more we kind of lean over, or the more that we just stay in a static posture, the more our body and our cells adapt to that posture. So you wanna spend time with specific joint training. What that basically means is you're taking each joint through its full range of motion actively instead of passively. And when you do this, you start building force as the language of cells by way of mechanoreceptors. All right, so mobility versus functional mobility again. Mobility capable of moving or being moved freely and easily. Functional mobility, the ability to actively achieve a range of motion flexibility, plus strength and control. Mobility training is an attempt to capture passive range of motion and make them active into usable ranges. For example, if we go into, so go ahead and stand up. Stand up. So we're gonna turn passive, passive uh, range into active range. So we're just going to hold on to a desk or a chair. We're gonna bring our knee up. We're gonna passively hold this position. We're gonna go up as high as we can, okay? And then what we're gonna do is make sure our opposite leg is straight, our back is straight here, pull it all the way up, dorsiflex the foot, and then from here, we're gonna let go, and then we're gonna see if we can keep that knee in that position and hold. Okay, and just try to hold it up, try to go up as high as you can, and then slowly relax. So that's turning a passive input into an active. We'll switch sides, even it out. Switch side. So holding that passive range, you're finding your passive range. Now this time I want you to irradiate. Okay, so I want you to, to inhale, hold, trap some air, and then hold and then hold it in and then let go. Try to pull it up a little bit higher, 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 up, 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 and slowly bring it down. Okay. So turning that hip flexion stretch, you can go ahead and sit down. So turning that hip flexion stretch, for example, 
where I'm here, instead of just passively sitting in this modality, just breathing, first do the breathing part, but then actively start progressing the angle, trying to push the knee down, and then regressing the angle by pulling into the ground deeper. So like a self PNF, who's heard of PNF stretching? Raise your hand. What does that mean? into a certain spread to certain position and then you activate the muscles and then you have the muscles. Okay. Now is that more, um, I guess, is that better than just passively stretching alone? Proven in the literature, right? PNF stretching is. It creates more mobility. So we can also do these methods ourselves using some of the things we'll talk about in the future here. So <clears throat> mobility training is an attempt to capture passive range of motion and make them active or usable. So instead of just passively holding this thinking, we're getting this awesome hip stretch, we're actually not sending any mechanical receptors by passively holding it. We have to actively hold it here to gain that angle. If you practice the ranges, articulations of the joint, you will earn that range. If you're getting injured in the internal rotation and extension of the glenohumeral humeral joint, it might be because you're not practicing being in that range. So how do you know if you're in that range? By putting yourself in those ranges each day. <clears throat> Every three years, your cells turn over. You are what you have been doing for the past three years. So if you have a mobility practice for the past three years, you're slowly getting a little bit better each year. So if you haven't been doing that, you're probably losing mobility. Just get a drink here. So it is not a surprise that people who sit most of the day lack adequate mobility. We didn't need mobility training thousands of years ago when we were moving most of the day. Before agriculture, for millions of years, we foraged. We are so far from what we evolved to be that we need some type of method that combats the de-evolution process. So some authors and researchers are actually saying that we're going through a de-evolution process because we sit so much. We're not like we used to be. Socks and shoes. You wear socks and shoes all the time, your feet are going to start going inward. What happens is you start losing your intrinsic foot strength. So it's really important to be barefoot and move your toes. So can you move your toes? Do you think that's important? No? Research the effects of limited toe mobility on intrinsic foot force production. So if you're interested, and learning more, you can always research. <clears throat> Trillions of neurons in a complex system. That's what our body is made up of. Rehabilitation adapts tissue to previous performance. This is a mistake. Rehab should create tissue that has higher resilience to load. Injury will happen again if this does not happen. So basically, we shouldn't rehab the athlete back to where they're previously at before they got injured because they'll just get injured because obviously their tissue wasn't uh, you know, load bearing enough to be able to take that. Healthy joints speak to millions of mechanical receptors that send afferents to the brain. In turn, efferents is sent down the spinal cord to the joint being moved. So this is just motor development and your body doesn't trust what it doesn't know. So for example, why can't I do a full split? Because my body doesn't trust it. My nervous system is telling my brain, my body is saying, no, if you do that, you're going to get injured. So your body is controlled by your central nervous system. So if, if it's not doing splits all the time, you're not going to get there. So FRC, functional range conditioning, looks to improve all movements by improving articular function. There are no quote unquote corrective exercises for movement. Movement practice corrects movement. The best posture is the one you don't stay in. The posture is the one you move out of into a different posture. So basically, the best posture is the one you don't stay in. So if we're always moving, we don't have to actually like think about posture as this thing where we want to stay neutral or we want to like stay a certain way because we're trying to sit up nice and tall. So it's really important that we're actually moving more so than being static. So FRC uses a couple concepts you should be familiar with. Principle of progression, progressive adaptation, incremental loads imparted on tissue result in adaptation of said tissue, such that the load absorption capacity improves. 
when you put load in a tissue, as long as you don't overload it, it will progressively overload. Load bone, body responds by adding bone, and load bearing exercise increased tissue. So every time you add stimulus, load, or stress, your body adapts, whether it's for the good or for the bad. So higher quality movements yield high quality results through the brain. So if you're sending your brain, the channel receptor, central nervous system feedback by getting into positions that you're not typically in and training those areas, you're going to be less likely to get injured into those areas. So a lot of times we don't think shoulder internal rotation, extension. Should I load this area? Yes, you should. Principles of specificity. So if you come in to my office or if you come into my clinic and you have an athlete, you know, with a shoulder issue, well, we've got to treat that shoulder. We've got to get that shoulder back to functioning. So the adaptation is specific to the demand. If you want to be able to have control, you have to practice controlling the angle slowly. <clears throat> bioflow. So bioflow is another concept a term used to explain and conceptualize the continuous nature of human movement and the tissue that produce it. Connected tissue is the most abundant form of cellular tissue. The components include cells, fibers, ground substance, muscle, tendon, ligament, capsule, bone, epi, peri, endomysium, tendon, to ligament, capsule, and periosteum. So all of these kind of go into each other. When you really break down the human body as in a cadaver form, but it almost seems like the tissue just runs into each other. Like right? muscle starts turning into tendon, tendon starts turning into ligament, ligament starts turning into bone, and it just kind of like conglomerates together. So that's what bioflow is really mean. That all your cells are basically able to connect in some type of fashion. You're more you're more uh, tensegrical than you probably think. So basically, when we look at um, that, so basically, bioflow demonstrates connected tissue running from bone to bone. Um, evolutionary perspective of health, what were we naturally selected to do? Uh, and now what are we actually doing? So basically, what were we naturally se selected to do? We were meant to run. We were meant to uh, jump. We were meant to do a lot of different outdoor activities like throwing. Um, what are we doing now? A lot of us might, me might not be doing any running. Might a lot of us might not be doing any physical activity or we're doing a sport. And so is sport basically, is sport functional? Is, is it functional to be an athlete? Sometimes it's not. Sometimes the athletes that come into clinics have um, the worst pronated feet you've ever seen or, or things that you think would be abnormal. So just because you play a sport doesn't mean you're going to be functioning, functionally like fully 100%. On a daily basis, how do you compensate for not doing what you're selected to do? Our physical makeup hasn't changed in hundreds of thousands of years, but in the past couple thousands of years, we are doing different things, and the joints need to move more than you think. So to carve out new tissue, it takes multiple inputs over many days. Um, FRC doesn't believe that you can just adjust somebody and they're just back to functioning. You might have limit. You might have um, a limited or a temporary relief of pain. Um, you may have, you know, a different feeling a little bit later. But it takes tons and tons of active inputs to actually change tissue. To keep this tissue, it takes maintenance. You can't change human tissue quickly, and you want to create space everywhere, form pockets, and you want to move tissue into that. <clears throat> so we have maintenance. So we're gonna go over controlled articular rotations today. We're gonna to go through the mobility routine together. And what are controlled articular rotations or CARS? Basically is maintenance. The pres prescription of CARS on a regular basis acts to maintain available ranges of motion by providing signaling for tissue remodeling to allow for maximal tissue elongations and range of motion maintenance. Engaging, training all articular mechanoreceptors on a regular basis or afferent training, so sending, sending quality inputs to the brain. Preventing maturation of fibrotic tissue. Delaying, preventing the onset of osteoarthritis in articular health and longevity. Articular health and longevity. Recall that cartilage has no blood supply. It receives oxygen and nutrition from the surrounding joint fluid by diffusion. But during movement, pressure expresses fluid and waste products out of the cartilage cells when it is relieved, 
fluid diffuses along with oxygen and nutrients. So health depends on your movement. In order to get blood supply to your um, cartilage, you have to move that area. So aberrant joint function is articular motion that causes restriction and or pain on the closing side of the joint. So a closing angle joint pain, for example, in a lateral flexion of my neck would be when, when I laterally bend to the left, if I had a joint pain this side, that would be closing angle joint pain. So that would be something we assess when we do our controlled articular rotations or cars. So we'll be checking to see if we have closing angle joint pain in all of our joints today. Okay. So this is just some pictures of what you might see people performing. Might go through some segmentation. So why rehabilitation, re restoring articular kinesthetic awareness, neuromuscular retraining, increasing passive articular strength and stability, inflammation control, uh, movement equals anti-inflammatory, familiarize nervous system with specific range of motion, increases neurological control of a sticky zone. Basically, if you get to a sticky zone, like if you get like right here or even a spot like um, shoulder, uh, scapular retraction, if you're going down and you're trying to get back up in the bench, basically. So breading down a global path for learning opportunities. So using full ranges and then use for variety during a kin stretch class. So kin stretch, kin stretch is the the yoga class form of FRC. So you can basically take a kin stretch class in most major cities, not Wilmington. Uh, functional range assessment. Basically you go through an articular screening, which is all active. There's no, it's not passive. So it doesn't believe in using a passive input as a, as a um, marker for their purposes, but you can definitely use them together. Cars demonstrates coupling or neurological disorganization of the movement. So when I flex my shoulder, does my scapula go along for the ride? Does my thoracic spine start to rotate? And if it does, that means I'm having joint coupling. If I have joint coupling, I don't actively own the range of my shoulder. If I don't actively own the range of my shoulder, I'm going to disperse the weight into my back, which I'll have maybe a back issue later if I'm also compensating on a different side. So if you can own the control of each joint independently, you're going to create a whole body that works better together. So <clears throat> Sherrington's law of irradiation, a muscle working hard recruits the neighboring muscles and if they are already part of the action, it amplifies their strength. The neural impulses emitted by the contracting muscle reach other muscles and turn them on as an electric current starts a motor. So basically during controlled articular rotations, we practice the law of radiation, the law of specificity, and uh, progressive overload. So basically taking yourself through all main training principles as you go through the articulations, as you would any exercise, right? So if I was going through a neck car, a neck controlled articular rotation, I would use the law of radiation. What does that mean? It means my whole body is still. So if you were to come try to push me over, I will try to stay up as hard as I could and just stood like a statue. When I go through my neck control articular rotation, what I do is I squeeze my fist, start using all my energy in the entire body. So inhale, trap air low in the lower abdominal region while shallow breathing, law of radiation, stabilize all articulations in order to ensure strict rotation in the desired joint, begin articular rotation slowly, ensuring that is occurring in the outer limit of movement and attempt to expand the circle with each repetition. So your first control articular rotation today will be your first level. You'll have all leveled up by today. You'll all be at level one. Now the goal is to take each joint through their full range of motion each day. As soon as you wake up, wake up, go through your full range of motion, your wrist, your elbow, your knee. It'll only take like 10 minutes. And what happens is over time, you, be, you get a little, you get 1% better every day. So 10 minutes, multiply that by seven. That's, you know, 700 minutes, multiply that by four. Multiply how many minutes of mobility training are you doing to actually maintain what you have? And this is only going to maintain, this is the bad news. This is only going to maintain what you have. If you don't do this, you get 1% worse as time goes by, unless you have a movement practice. So if you don't have a mobility practice, this would be that for you. So... You're trying to expand the circle 
again, if there's closing angle joint pain, you want to go around that, but you don't have to be afraid of pain either. So I'm not saying dig into pain. I'm saying just go around it. doesn't mean you can't do a circle in your wrist because there's pain. Just go around that pain. Take it easy, okay? So we're going to go through some of those today. So for example, my neck, squeezing, begin to irradiate, inhale, trap air low, and then my neck. And then I'll go through the cue. So I would go flexion, rotation, lateral bend, extension, lateral bend, rotation, flex down. And if I, if you see my shoulders moving, you see my hips moving, then I'm not able to actually control my neck. I'm actually cheating through that range of motion. So if I was going to do my glenohumeral joint, flexion. Now if I were to start going like this, then you know the pressure is going to my back. That's the case. I shouldn't be doing any overhead pressing, right? But a lot of our athletes, you take 100 athletes and you test their overhead active range. I'm not talking passive range with a, with a bar on it. So that's passive because they're holding onto the bar. Now, what is their active range of motion? Do they join couple? Do they, do they turn and open up because they're trying to cheat um, internal rotation? So for a glenohumeral joint, squeezing this hand. You can also use a dowel, you can add levels, you can hold on to a tennis ball. But this would be the basic version, flexion, internal rotation, but people will cheat here and just supinate the hand. So I'm talking internal rotation at the glenohumeral joint, which means that the bicep should turn forward. And then as I internally rotate, I go into extension. I try not to move anything else. Keep internally rotating. Notice that my scapula is starting to elevate I'm going to try to bring it down, keep internally rotating, and then that's half of rep one. And then extension, then external rotation, flexion, forward, and down. And then the more reps I get, the more mechanical receptors I give to my brain that enhances and adapts the tissue in this area. So I become resilient to external rotation because I practice external rotation or I build resilient in external rotation so I don't get a UCL injury in a baseball game. So what you're doing is you're mitigating injury through going first through your assessment in the morning and saying, oh, you got closing angle joint point pain, or I got an issue here. Maybe I need to work through this area. Maybe I need to do 30 of these today, okay? So if I have a left hip issue, which I do, and left shoulder issue, which I do, I do spend a lot more time on these areas. Specificity is key, and it's gotten gradually a little bit better. So, any questions before we get started? Is there a such thing as too much flexibility? So, yes, too much flexibility, but functional mobility, I would say there's not enough functional mobility. Functional mobility is having active control of what you're doing. Being able to hold on to 100 pounds, Come down into dorsiflexion, hold on, squeeze, and not get injured. Flexibility is like the ability to try to get in this crazy back bend, right, and hold it for as long as we can. And that's, well, we don't think that's really functional because what is that purpose of a static position really serving an athlete? We want them to have active range. What other questions we got? So I am certified in yoga. So um, when I took this course, functional range conditioning, it kind of flipped everything upside down because I was a guy that talked about yoga. I was a guy that talked about foam rolling. And now I'm like, now I don't use those things anymore. So when you learn something new, for me, if it's not scientifically proven, then I don't go back to it. So, I mean, I'm not saying passive inputs like massage therapy or foam rolling or passive stretching for long periods of time aren't a, bad, aren't a good idea. I'm just saying that you have to learn how to create angular isometric load in those different joint angles. So we're gonna start by just standing up. All right, so, Find a, a little bit of space maybe in the aisles. We'll start with our neck and our work, we'll work our way down. 
All right. So um, if you have closing angle joint pain or any pain, I'm not forcing you to go through any motion. So if you want to take one of these off, you can. If something's bothering you, I'm not going to judge you or anything. We're just trying to learn here, okay? So basically, I want you to try the law of specificity, which is basically thinking I'm only trying to move what he's asking me to move. Now, you're trying to stabilize the whole body using a radiation. So that is proven to help you control muscle tissue. If you're squeezing on for something, it's more important to squeeze your opposite fist, your body, and everything else, and really anything, because then you know you're contracting the all or none principle. So we're going to be about 30 to 40% intensity here. So I don't want you to be like, oh, like squeezing like major heart. And obviously, you're not going to radiate what's being moved. I'm not going to radiate my neck or it won't move, right? So your neck is going to have to be really kind of loose. And you're going to be really trying to explore the space that you're allotted. And this is basically like learning functional anatomy and going over functional anatomy for your joints. And it's also going to help you know what your body does by doing it daily. All right. So we're going to start with the neck. We're going to spread the floor apart with our feet. The, the quads are going to have a little bit of intensity, about 30%. Hands are out by the sides. We're going to squeeze the fists. Chin is in line with the sternum and navel. We're going to bring the shoulders nice. Everywhere. Everything's in a neutral position, so we're, we don't want to be elevated or depressed or anything like that. Everything is just nice and tall. And then from here, just going to focus on the neck here. From here, we're going to flex down. Radiate. Rotate to your right. Bend into that side. You're going to look back over the shoulder, all the way back to extension. Look over your other shoulder. Bend into that side. And look down. Continue that circle two more times. Down. Rotate. Bend. Extend back. Finding your range here. Look over the opposite shoulder and down. One more. Rotate. Bend. Extend back. Rotate to the other side, flex down, and come back to neutral. You just kind of relax. You're going to go the other way now. All right, here we go. Irradiate, neutral position, flex down, rotate to your right, or sorry, your left. Look over the shoulder, look back, over the other shoulder, and look down. Keep squeezing, radiate, look down, rotate, bend. Extend, rotate, rotate the other way, flex down, one more. Just trying to find the space there. Okay. Now, did anyone experience any pain or have a closing? Like when you went to a site, you're like, oh, I felt a little something. So that's something that you would write down immediately if you're doing an assessment on somebody or yourself. Like, okay, back left, a little issue there when I was doing that. Okay, and then there's your assessment. So for your scapula, hands are glued next to the sides. I don't want you to bring the hands off the thighs. That means you're either flexing the glenohumeral. We're not doing that. We're using the scapula or you're extending the glenohumeral. So we're just using the scapula here. So the hands are glued next to the side. Try not to bend the elbows and try not to extend the wrists or flex the wrists. So everything's nice and straight. Pretend you're holding on to like $100 bills here. Or you like that girl from Saturday Night Live. She does that. Anybody know that one? Yeah. Wait. Yeah, she does that. Okay. So, <laughs> all right. So, what we're going to do is we're going to squeeze everything like we're holding on to a $100 bill, irradiate your abs, everything's a squeezing here. We're going to elevate, retract, depress, all the way down, protract. Elevate, retract. Press, protract, elevate, retract, try not to move your head and shoulders, all the way down. Let's go the other way. So all the way down, the press, all the way down, retract, elevate, protract, keep those hands glued, all the way down. Keep the body intense here, a radiation high here, all the way up, forward and down, one more, down. Retraction, elevation, protraction here. Okay, so another assessment you could 
you felt a little issue there in your right or left, you could uh, write that down. Another way to get the scapula, you bring the arms out in front of the shoulders, out about 10 degrees, squeeze the fists. And we're going to keep try to keep those elbows straight. This one's a little bit harder because we don't we're not we're not using the body as feedback. So you actually have to squeeze your biceps, triceps a little bit more. Squeeze everything so the elbows don't bend, and squeeze the wrist here. From here, we're going to retract and protract without bending the elbows. So going forward, retract, protract, elevate, retract, and depress, and try to follow that circle. Follow that circle. Try not to move anything else. And reverse it, two circles. Try not to move anything else. And relax. Okay, that was the scapula again. Now for your thoracic spine, or your upper back, or your T-spine, we're gonna start with our hands across our chest. He can be a little bit wider. Now, when I say T-spine, a lot of people uh, we'll bring the hips back, so we want to make sure that we don't bring our hips back. So when I say flexion, don't do it yet, but it'll be flexion of the T-spine, and then it'll be rotation at the T-spine. Now, a lot of people think their back moves. It only moves like a couple millimeters. So when we move our back and stuff like this, we're actually moving a lot more things. So upper back, what we'll do, I'll go through it first. It'll be a flexion, rotation, lateral bend extension, lateral bend, rotation, flex down. So same action as the neck. So inhale, trap the air low before you do the circle. Take an inhale, radiate, flex down, rotate to the right, shoulder dips to the right side, extend back, bend to the left side, rotate into the left side, flex down. Keep following that circle. All the way back, laterally bend to the other side and flex down. All right, let's try the other way. So that time we went to the right, this time we'll go to the left. So squeeze everything, flex down, rotate to the left, bend into the side, extend back, bend to the other side, rotate down and around, all the way around, all the way to the left, bend into the side, Extend back, bend into the other side, and rotate down, and relax. Okay, so there's your T-spine. You can also do that in a chair. You can do that kneeling. You can do all these things in all different positions. We're just going over standing today. Now, for your glenohumeral, you're going to be able. To, you're going to have to do a windmill. So make sure you're able to do that in the space you're at now. Now, this is zero percent irradiation. Okay, I'm not giving any feedback to the, uh, I'm not giving any inference to my brain when I do this, but when I control it, when I take it through that active range of motion, the more you radiate, the more you think about it, the more you're gonna be able to adapt tissue in that area. Over long periods of time, this isn't just, you just get a healthy shoulder by doing one uh, car, okay, or just one, you know, rotation. It takes so many inputs for your tissue to adapt. And so a lot of people think there's quick fixes that everyone it really is no magic fairy dust that you can sprinkle on your client and say, oh yeah, I, I fixed you two, you know, two visits. So many active inputs. So here we go with a glenohumeral joint. So you can just stand nice and tall. Left arm is out. So we're gonna you we'll go with our right hand. So be able to move your right hand if, if you got a desk in front of you. Just be, you might want to face this way. Okay, so from here, we're going to go into flexion of the glenohumeral joint, hold here, good, and then from here, we're going to internally rotate the bicep all the way in, and we're going to reach back, keep from here, freeze, we're going to keep internally rotating the shoulder, but try not to bring the head forward, all the way into extension, all the way back, and the back of the hand should be next to the side here, okay. Now we're gonna go ahead and go the other way, squeeze opposite fist, extension, external rotation, all the way to flexion, forward and down. Let's go over one more, flexion, internal rotation, extension, try not to open up the chest, and all the way down and reverse it, external rotation, 
flexion forward and down. All right, let's get our other side. Shake it out if you need to. Take an inhale, go ahead and go to flexion. Turn the bicep forward, reach back, keep internally rotating. Try not to move anything else. Back of the hands next to the side. From here, extend back, external rotation of the shoulder, all the way to flexion, forward and down. One more time here, flexion all the way up, squeeze the opposite fist, internal rotation, try to open up the chest and head here, back of the hand next to the side. And from here, extension, external rotation, all the way to flexion, forward and down. Okay, elbows and wrists, elbows next to the sides, elbows glued next to the rib cage, and then extend the elbow. Really try to supinate the palms here. And then from here, we're gonna flex the elbow. Try to keep your wrist straight as much as you can, and then pronate and use your biceps and triceps, squeeze all the way down. Supinate, flex, pronate, extend. And now we're gonna go out like a T. So there's a different way to do it. So we're gonna go all the way, supination, external rotation, bend all the way, pronate, extend, supinate, flex, pronate, extend, and then relax it. Okay, wrists, I want you to take one hand and hold on to the opposite. And all I want you to do is use this hand for radiation and <laughs> squeeze a little bit more. All we're gonna do here is just uh, extend the wrist down. So if you're looking, if you're asking yourself, what is my active range? You can test it by just going like this real quick. So if you can get a flat book, like this is pretty good. I would allow him to, you know, go ahead and go through a front squat or a front loaded squat. I might not, I might not trust somebody whose hand say goes like this, right? Because that means that they're, their, their angle, their joint angle isn't able to load that capacity. So from here, squeeze down to the wrists, extend, and go in, in and up, up, up and out, all the way out, out and down, all the way in, in and up, up, up and out, out, out and down. Let's go the other way. Nice and slow, kind of find your outermost Range here, go as slow as you can. Slower the better, all the way around. Okay, and then other side. You really squeeze here all the way to extension. Go in, in and up, up, up and out, out, out and down, all the way down. All the way down and in, in and up, up and out, all the way down. And then as slow as you can the other way, all the way out and up, up, up and down and in, all the way out, all the way up, up and in, okay? Now for our hip, um, you might hold on to a, a desk. We can do the standing. And basically we're going through hip flexion, abduction, internal rotation to extension, and then extension, abduction, external rotation to flexion, okay? So, you can hold on to a wall or a desk. You're gonna to try to maintain your, your body the whole time. So try not to move all around, just try to move that hip. Now, if this was more advanced, you could put like anything really behind the leg because you wanna keep that knee bent the whole time. A lot of people will start to extend that knee, okay? So I'll do it like this and then you can use the side. So um, we'll start with our uh, right hip. So. Left hand will be on a desk or a chair or something. What we're gonna do first is just go into hip flexion. Okay. Dorsiflexion of the ankle and then abduction and hold. Try not to open up your whole body. And then from here, we just want to try to get that foot toward the ceiling into internal rotation and hold it here. And then from here, we're gonna go into extension Knee goes next to knee, knee is still bent. Trying to keep your back straight. Flexion, abduction, internal rotation.
Try not to arch the back and down and relax. We'll go the other way. Okay. Bend the knee. Hip extension. External rot rotation to abduction. All the way forward. One more time back. Keep the knee bent. Out. And forward and down. Okay, cramping is normal. <laughs> cramping is normal. Okay. That is just your nervous system telling you something. Okay, it's telling you, it's giving you feedback. Being tight, having cramps, it's just your body telling you something. It's telling you to move it more, uh, to pay attention to it, go through these until it doesn't happen. You know, because it, unless you're doing stuff like this where you're actually taking the joint through its articular range of motion, as opposed to, okay, let's do a shoulder stretch and downward dog, right? But I'm also working my calves, I'm also working my hips, I'm, I'm doing 20 other things at the same time. So when I went from yoga to FRC, I was like, oh, we're actually improving functional mobility. That's a big difference between passive mobility or passive flexibility and mobility is that we're actually earning our range. We're actually gonna keep our resilient tissue after we actually practice this. All right, so other hip, right? Left hip, all right, flexion, now you can challenge yourself without using anything like this, okay, abduction, internal rotation, all the way to extension, flexion, as high as you can go, flexion here, abduction, internal rotation, all the way to extension and relax the foot down. We're gonna get two reps the other way. All the way goes into the right leg, bend that left knee, extension, abduction into external rotation, deflection, all the way back. Keep the knee bent, all the way out. Keep the knee bent, all the way forward and all the way down. Whew. All right, for this one, for the knee, we can go seated if you can see me. All right. So we're going to, if you want, if somebody can't do this, they can always have their back against the wall. But basically, we're going to hold on underneath our hamstring. Good grip here. We're going to dorsiflex the ankle just so it's locked. And then we're going to externally rotate the tibia. And then internally rotate the tibia. So just the shin moves here. Externally rotate. Now, if you have joint coupling here, your hip will start cramping up. Okay. So external rotation of the tibia. Foot's off the ground. Go into extension. 75% here. Internal rotation. And all the way down. Out. Extend. In. Down. There we go. In and up. Out. Down. In, up, out, down, and now we'll get that ankle over here. Hold on to the shin nice and tight. Plantar flex here. In. Now I really want you to use that calf here. Down, down and in, in, and then up, up, all the way up. Really use that tissue right there. All the way out, all the way down. Down, down and in, in, in and up, 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 up and out. All the way down, let's reverse it, two circles the other way, nice and slow. See what range you have. The quicker you go, the less force you're able to produce. Remember that, so more force, slower you go here. Especially when it comes to you trying to control that tissue. Now let's go to the left leg or the opposite leg. Okay, external rotation of the tibia. And then we'll go in, go out. And in, one more time out, heel up, and then extend, in, flex, try to really squeeze that forearm, out, up, in, down, out, up, you're going to hold it here, down, <laughs> in, up, out, down, in, up, all right, now we'll get the ankle, Point the toe, plantar flex. Y'all are doing good. In, in and up, up, 
all the way up. Really dorsiflex. Really feel all that tissue in here working here. All the way out, out and down, down. Use that gas track. All the way down and in, in, in and up, up, up and out and around. Let's go the other way. All the way up. Use that fibularis anterior. In, in and down. Use a gas track. Gas pedal down and out, out, all the way up, up, up and in, in, in and down. Now for the patella, it's the only, <coughs> only joint that we will do passive modalities to. So you want to make sure that your leg is totally relaxed. Some people it might help to bring one foot in. I, I'm able to do this with my legs out. So basically, we're going to take our two thumbs and bring our hands underneath the knee. We're just going to take that kneecap through a 360 degree circle. Now it should have really good movement. Now if it didn't go into a particular area, that would be something that you'd want to write down on your assessment. So it should go around 360 degrees, go six o'clock, nine o'clock, all the way to 12, all the way to three. And if it hurts or if there's any pain, that's something that you want to take note of. Okay, now you should go about three, three circles one way, three circles the other. <laughs> All right, now let's try the other side. Try the other side. Okay, now if there's clicking and it doesn't hurt, it's probably okay. But if there's clicking and it hurts, that might be something that you might want to pay attention to. Okay, so you should have active, you should be able to kind of maneuver that patella around in a circle. And yes, it is important to know what, what your kneecap is able to do. Otherwise, you know, you could have an issue there. I've had patellar uh, surgery. I've had um, some tissue kind of taken out behind my patella, so I know what it's like to not, you know, have to really rehab that. All right, so our toes. Who wants to see some toes? Who wants to see some toes? All right, let's do it. All right, stand up. <laughs> All right. See the toes. It's all right. It'll be all right. All right, so we got we almost got the whole morning mobility routine done. Okay. All right. So with our feet. All right. We should be able to move our toes a little bit, believe it or not. All right. So, yeah, she's got really good toe mobility right there. I saw that. She's getting, her toes are dancing over there. All right. So what we're going to do is just try to lift all ten toes off the ground. But first, make sure that all three aspects of the foot are on the ground. The medial, upper, outer, upper, and the heel is pushing into the ground. So we're not going into... Uh, inversion or eversion here. So trying to keep the foot flat here. All ten toes off the ground. So all ten toes off the ground. You might cramp. Okay, now try to separate the toes. Try to separate the toes. Okay. So far I'm seeing pretty good toe mobility. Yeah, I'm, I'm actually really impressed. That's well, I mean, we're all pretty young, so that's good. I mean, you'll see, I have some, I have some older clients who can't get their toes off the ground. All right, now from here, now just the big toe up. Notice if one toe doesn't go up as high as the other. Now really try to get that big toe up. So, all right. Now from here, big toe down, small toes up. <laughs> that's all right. I really try, try to get those small toes up. If they don't go up, that, that's when you can start to use some passive modality. So like, for example, if my toes didn't go up, I could definitely use my hands. All right. Now all toes up. We're going to piano them down from pinky to big toe. Pinky to big toe down. And then all toes up again. Try it one more time. Pinky to big toe down. Now all toes up. Now just the big toe is going to touch the ground. Three taps. There'll be one, and then two, and then three. What does it mean when like your second toe goes down to your toe? It's just a joint cup like it's, it's yeah, it's not able to work on its own. And that's what we're trying to do. Okay. Yeah, so um, for example, if I was trying if I had someone that couldn't get their toe off the ground. What I would might do, and you can do this for any joint, and I'll start with the toes. Yeah, you can. Um, but what you could do 
And I don't want you to force, I don't want to force this on you right now, but basically I take my big toe and uh, flexion or uh, extension here. And then I would hold passively, inhale four, exhale eight for about two minutes. And then just like PNF, I would start progressing the angular load. So that's called progressive angular isometric load. I'll start trying to push into the table from zero to 100%. And then I would try to extend the toe away from the barrier. So that's that's called pals and rails. And that's what we're gonna get into next. All right, so you can put your socks on if you want, unless you're good. Get some water. <laughs> That's why I did not recommend it. <laughs> so pals and rails are going to be something we'll talk about. So if the load is greater than capacity, there'll be an injury. If the load is less than or equal, to, you'll get to rehab. And if the capacity is greater than the load, you'll have prevention. So pals and rails rehabilitation. So basically... What we learned from our CARS routine lets us know where we need to uh, add um, load to or what we need to fix. So PALS and RALS are progressive and regressive angular isometric load. Main goals of PALS and RALS is to teach the nervous system how to control larger ranges of motion, prepares the tissue to function newly acquired ranges, increase tissue resilience. Each of these goals are required via inducing progressive adaptation in order that the tissues adapt to increasing levels of load. Thus, by using PALS and RALS on damaged tissue, we are able to induce adaptations that will benefit the healing process. Okay, so basically, a PALS and RALS is when you get into an end range, such as a 90-90 position, and I have my front hip at external rotation, my back hip at uh, hip internal rotation. And what I'm doing here is I'm getting into end range of external hip rotation here on the ground. And you've probably seen something like this before. You've seen a pigeon pose, right? And kind of wondering, you know, what am I actually doing here? And I'm not sure yet. So that's why we get into the 90-90 position. So we know what we're actually assessing, what we're actually training. So what we're doing here is we're in the end range of external hip rotation. I can do this on the ground. I can do this on a table, okay? I can do it on a box. I can do it, I can do it like this, okay? You can do it like this. Go ahead and cross your leg across your knee here, okay? So go ahead and do that. And so I'll show you from the ground what we can all do in many different positions. So what we're going to do is hold passively. We're going to bring our chest forward and back straight and kind of lean over. And just yeah, and we are we're all there because we're just in different planes of motion. <laughs> so from here, what we're gonna do is hold on to something, try to get our back straight, chest forward. If you want to get into this position, come down to the ground. So if you want to try the 90-90 position, come down to the ground. All right. So you can do the seated or the 90-90. Now the front foot should be in line with the back knee and shin. Okay, so we should be at a 90 degree angle. Okay, now, yeah, now a regression would be to, to sit on the chair. So if this, if we're starting to cramp, what you might need to do is just kind of lean to the side. That's fine. Regress. So there's regressions to all this. But from here, instead of just flexing the spine forward, we're actually going to keep our chest high, use our hands like kickstands. We're going to lean forward over the shin. You should feel a good stretch in the back uh, medius of the glute. Just breathe here. Okay, we're trying to bring that chest and head up. Okay, breathe here. So you can hold this for about two minutes. Okay, we won't we won't get we won't get there yet, but we would want to build up to two minutes passive hold, and then we're going to pretend there's a scale underneath our shin here. So we're going to start. Irradiating our whole body starting to contract. We're going to press our foot, shin, and knee into the ground at about 10% effort. You should start feeling the tissues on the outside of the hips start firing up. So now we're at 20% effort, 30% effort, 40%, not 100, 
50 percent 60 effort pushing into the ground start pushing the hands into the ground use everything 70 percent 80 percent don't go to injury or pain 90 percent 100 percent and hold for five four three keep the irradiation intensity high now try to pull that knee and foot off the ground all the way up 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 five hold it four lean back if you need to three Two, and slowly bring it down. All right? So, this is like the self, like PNF, but one more step. So you go on the progressive angle here is me trying to go deeper or out of external hip rotation. The regressive angle is me trying to pull back deeper into external hip rotation. So I'm building that capacity in this end range. And it's fully functioning. I'm trying to get that fully functioning hip going. So now we're going to get the other side. You might be tighter here. You might be a little looser here. Now, try not to have our knees bent too much. You, you won't feel it as much. That can be a regression. A progression would try to really get those knees at 90. We're facing that front knee. This front foot is in line with our back knee and shin. Okay. Hands are like kickstands. Again, chest leans forward over the knee. You should feel a good stretch there in that glute. Passively holding, no radiation here. We're just breathing. You would tell a client, inhale five, exhale 10, hold here two minutes passively, or build up to two minutes, maybe work 30 seconds like we're doing, and then go into slow pals and rows. Pals and rows can last a little bit longer than we're doing as well. Typically, you'd want to wind up for about 30 seconds and regress for about 15. From here, starting to press the foot, shin, and knee into the ground at 10%, not 100, 20%. You should be fine here at 30%. Push the hands into the ground. You can kind of cheat with the body position here, 40%, 50, 60, 70, 80, 90, 100% of your safest and greatest effort, pushing that leg into the ground. Five, four, three, two. You try to pull it off the ground. Go deeper into external hip rotation. Pull it up, up, up. Lean back if you need to. Five, four, three, two, and slowly bring it down. Okay? So that would be hip external rotation now if you wanted to get your internal what we would do is just go ahead and twist toward the back leg you're just kind of twisting toward that back leg option one here option two reaching out like this okay so now we're in internal hip rotation the pals here will be pressing this foot and knee into the ground at about 10 percent effort 20 percent effort and then the rails would be trying to get that foot off the ground. Try that. Try a rail contraction. Try to get that foot off the ground. Okay? And then you can kind of play with this where you do a hip hover. So you squeeze your fist here. You hover. And then you go into abduction here. And then come back. You can do a knee hinge. Okay? Woo! All right. So if you were thinking about ankle dorsiflexion, if you can get into this position or if this doesn't work, you'd want to use a box. So if this gives you any pain, I don't advise you to do this. So what proper dorsiflexion, you should be able to lean over that tissue here, in the middle of the chest, over the knee. If that doesn't work right now, don't worry about this one. I'll just go through a quick demonstration. So I would start progressing the angle by pushing the toe and foot into the ground using the gas drop. From zero to 100, we're not going to go up to well, 30%. So pushing down with a gas drop, but leaning into that end range. And then the rails would try to be to pull up and go deeper using the anterior tissues. Going deeper into that stretch using the other side of the tissue here. And then relaxing back. Okay, so that would be ankle dorsiflexion. Okay. All right. And now we'll do a partner one. So go ahead and grab a partner. <laughs> so last one we'll do get a partner who needs a partner? partner 
All right, so you're going to take someone's hands like this. Yeah, we're going to go like this. You can be my demonstrators. So you can go into end range. Find end range where you think it feels good. Try not to lean. Stand up nice and tall. So what we're going to now, can you lift off her hands an inch from there? Okay. Hold right there. So that's all right. That's all right. Try to go, try to go wherever they go. So we're just going to hold this passive uh, shoulder extension. So go ahead and go back. Okay. Now from here, the person that is getting stretched, you're going to start pushing down. That's going to be your pal contraction. The person holding it, you have to hold still. You're the barrier. So keep those wrists straight. So if you're too far to your end range, go down a little bit. Don't start too high. All right. Now start trying to stand up. And then when you go through your pals, it's pushed down. Rails is try to lift off the hands. All right. Here we go. Pushing down. 10%. 20, 30%, 40%, 50%, hold it, 5, 4, 3, 2, now try to lift off and go deeper into extension, hold it, 5, 4, 3, 2, and slowly bring it down. All right, now switch. <laughs> first passive stretch should first passive stretch find a good end range that's some end range all right now we're gonna start pressing down 10 percent 20 percent 30 percent 40 percent 50 percent. What did we go to last time? 60, 70, and hold, hold it, 5, 4, 3, 2, and now try to lift away from the hands actively. Don't help them. Hold it, 5, up, 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 4, 3, 2, and slowly bring it down. Okay? Now, every joint angle that you can think of, external rotation of the shoulder using a wall, Okay, you could definitely use a wall or a beam or a TRX strap. So I'd hold passive range here using a TRX <laughs> strap, right? Progressive angle, if you're trying to go out of the stretch, it's not going to move. And then regressively, if you're trying to find some slack in that end range. Same thing, internal uh, rotation of the shoulder. Same thing uh, with the knees, the ankles, the hands, the wrists. So anything can be kind of broken down and kind of really fixed, so to say, if you go through one, that assessment in the morning, you know what to work with. And then also using the pals and rails to create space in end range and also to strengthen the space. So that's basically in a nutshell what functional range conditioning is. And you'll get this PowerPoint um, and this link, like I told you, you'll be able to access it, yada, yada, yada. But it'll have all the information if you're looking for more information on videos, like how to go through the mobility program, specific stuff for your hips, specific stuff for your shoulders. Um, and then the mobility certification um, is $800. It's a weekend course. Uh, it'd be a good tool to have, you know, especially with competing trainers in the field who are trying to kind of get the latest stuff. So I would definitely prescribe it over um, yoga, uh, I wouldn't say that yoga is a replacement or this is a replacement for yoga, but I just think yoga has more of a, um, it just depends on the yoga teacher. Uh, so it's really hard to say that yoga is, is for this or it's for that because it just depends on who's teaching it, really. So functional range conditioning, you kind of know what, to, what you're going to get. So it's more concrete. It's more science-based. All right. Any questions for y'all? Hello? I think y'all got to go, right? All right. All right, next slip. Yeah. Right, yeah, we got one this time. I got away with it two weeks in a row. Two months. Two months. Two months. Two months. Two months. Two months. Yes, because it's open here. Oh, dang it. What else? That's it, right? We just don't have a